Good morning, Trinity family. It's so good to be with you in worship again this morning. My name is Daniel Jackson. I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity United Methodist Church. And if you're a guest, we are so honored that you rested and joined us this morning, even virtually. And we can't wait to meet you in person. We ask at this time, you prepare your hearts for worship. Genesis 28, verses 10 through 19. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel but the name of the city was Luz at the first. We all know the name Jacob's Ladder, and today we get to dive a little deeper into what that story really is all about. And actually, if you look in the Hebrew, the word ladder actually is better translated as stairway. So with your permission, today we are going to call this Jacob and the Stairway to Heaven. Um, this is a lot more epic than a ladder. There is a, a profound revelation of God's presence going on here and a shift in Jacob's story as a result that we want to tap into and we want to listen to because this is what we need as a church. This is what we need as believers in this hour. So I ask that you pray with me 
and ask that the Lord would speak to us through this story, through his word right now. Lord, we offer up the soil of our hearts like we talked about last week for transformation. And we know that the only thing that can transform us, the only thing that can really change us is you. So we ask that you'd meet us, that you reveal your presence in our hour, right here where we are, that you're, that you're speaking, that you're moving, that you're with us, that you're for us, that you're good, and you're inviting us into your good works. We pray all these things in your son Jesus, the revelation of God to us. Amen. Jacob knew the stories of God. Jacob had a grandfather and a father who I'm sure bored him to death with these stories about God all day long, about what God was faithful in and, and how God came through here and there. And, and I don't know about you, but if you grew up in church or even in the cultural Christian South, you're familiar with the stories of God. And sometimes, if we're honest, they can get a little stale. They can, they can become these stories that we're just like, yeah, 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 I've heard that one before, you know, and, and I can just imagine Jacob going, yeah, granddad, I know, I know. Yeah, grandma, yeah, I, I know. God came through, you can have a child, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome, that's how dad got here. I'm excited. Um, but it hasn't struck his heart in, in, a, in a personal way. Now, I remember being kind of this, a little bit of a rascal that Jacob was growing up um, in church every Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening church, anybody? And in Sunday evening, there was a, a lot of hymns sung and my best friend in church, Adam Barnes and I, we'd go sit in the very back corner. Let me rephrase that. We were told to go sit in the very back corner so that we would not cause a scene because we really like to make each other laugh. We got these little prayer cards that were in the back of the pews and we get the little pencils that come with them and we draw pictures and, and, and they'd be epic scenes of, of war. And of, um, I, I remember drawing a big military ship that was shooting, a, uh, shooting over at his and, and we're sitting there in the back and we're cracking up and we're getting little, you know, those little glances over from mom and dad because we, it's like we've heard these stories. Oh yeah, we're going to church again. There's knowledge, but there's not that experiential knowledge of God yet that really makes you get traction in your relationship. We had the kind of rules and regulations uh, of what we were supposed to do. And I would say there was even a, a, a grace to follow our parents' good leadership and walking in them, but we didn't really know God personally. God felt like a distant idea. And I feel like so many people in, in, in our culture right now are stuck in that posture and approach towards Christianity, where God feels like a distant idea. We know a lot about God, but we don't really know God. The problem with this is that it produces dead religion. Uh, dead religion is, is the, the kind of non-personal faith that Jacob has where he tricks his father into giving up um, Esau's birthright to him. Um, it's this form of godliness is what scripture says, but with, with, with lacking the power. It's where we've inherited a lot of facts and figures and, and rules and regulations, but we're lacking the, the, the rules, that we're lacking the relationship that makes it come alive. Or in other words, we, we have all the trappings of faith, but we're lacking the, the oil that makes um, the, the flame come alive or the oil that makes the, the machine run. And this is a, a surefire way to lead to hypocrisy. Um, Jacob lives a life that acknowledges God and yet denies the God of righteousness by his actions. This is what the unbelieving world around us finds unbelievable, is the hypocrisy they find in our churches. So what we have to offer the world in this hour has to be something, and here's the key word, authentic, something tangible, something they can taste and see is good. It, it can't just be more knowledge. It can't just be more facts. Honestly, it can't just be more sermons. There are so many sermons out there, and if that's all our church has to offer, our neighborhood, 
I'm afraid we're going to come up short. Because if the words that we speak and the knowledge that we have doesn't have relationship, doesn't have the source it's plugged into, then it's dead religion. It's not living faith. The good news is that we serve a, a, a living God who desires to, to manifest the good news in our lives in a powerful, relational way. But this cultural Christianity that we live in is a story we all know well. It's, it's this actual story that all of us are familiar with of Christianity, of the cross. The cross has become a cultural symbol that anybody could wear. It's not necessarily religious, but it's the, the, the crucifixion. It's the execution device of our Savior that's become so cultural it can just be a fashion um, decoration in our house. So the question is, we know about the story, we know some facts, but I wonder if, if, if you and I are honest with ourselves where we are right now, how much we are in that story. How much we can say that um, we really know our parts that we play in that story. And maybe some of us, we knew the story at one point and we knew our part in it, but we're re rehearsing old lines. Or we've, we've even stopped the play altogether because maybe people aren't showing up anymore. And, and so our question is, how do, we, how do we spark life in this thing again, in this, in this great play of faith that we're in? How do, we, how do we reinvigorate things and it not be for show? How do, we, how do we do this thing for real to where people can taste and see that it's good? And so good that it's actually the natural overflow of experiencing that they want to bring people and invite people into it. The answer lies here in our text for the day, and it's a revelation of God's presence. I'm going to say that again. The answer for re-enlivening the play is to invite the playwright back into the story, to become aware of the, the new words that are being spoken in this hour, and listen and be attentive and open for transformation and what you might be invited into. It is the revelation of God's presence here and now working among us. We need a revelation of God's presence. The question is, how do we get it? How do we come in contact? And how do we have this encounter that Jacob had that's so transformational for him? I think if we're looking at Jacob's story, the honest answer is there's nothing we can do to manufacture that encounter because Jacob didn't do anything to ask for it. We don't see him go and make an altar and then God shows up with a dream. He was just on his way. He was just obeying what his father Isaac had told him to do, which is to go find a wife among his kinspeople. And God met him there on the way. So how do we get this revelation from God? We can't do much, but I wonder if, like we talked about in the last few weeks, if we can listen. If that's the word for our hour for this season as Trinity United Methodist Church, to listen, if that's the right posture, because in reality, prayer is not much more than listening. It's not much more than than actually becoming aware and more and more aware to have ears to hear, to have eyes to see what God is doing, what God is up to, where God is, and then being open to join in. Most of discipleship is actually teaching people to pray. So we're teaching people in, 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 in how to listen, how to watch, how to be aware of God's presence. And I wonder if this is what all of these stories that Abraham and Isaac and Sarah and Rebecca, um, what the purpose of all of those stories through time were, were to build an expectation and awareness of God's presence and movement and faithfulness build those things up in Jacob 
so that he is able to walk in obedience when he, when he hears the word from the Lord, so that he's able um, to be aware on his journey of God's presence coming, where he's prepared to be able to respond when God reveals his presence. I wonder if this is what my years in the pews with Adam Barnes, drawing in the back of the corner of the room and, and hearing these words and hearing these hymns and having them soak in, to where when God's presence did show up and there was a revelation of, of God in my life in middle school, all of a sudden I'm going, all of this stuff is falling in place. I was growing in awareness of God through all these years. And when God revealed himself, I knew who it was. I knew the stories and I knew the categories and I knew the, the framework and, and I knew my part in it. I knew what I was being called to. So this may be a better way for a lot of us to think about discipleship and to think about even something as scary for a lot of people as evangelism is to inviting people into a, a living relationship by learning stories that bring an awareness of God's presence right now, that, that teach us how God has moved in the past, in generations past, that teach us God's character, that we, be, we can become students of how God moves. We can become students uh, sitting and listening and watching at God's faithfulness through the generations so that we build up this awareness and this trust to be able to step out when we hear the word. But the key point is, is that are we listening to hear the word, the now word? I wonder um, in, in this hour, if you're like me, I, I was a youth pastor for years and, and I had the question, should we force our kids to go to church? Should we require them to go to youth group? Should we, should we make them do it? Is it something that we're forcing on them um, that they're going to rebel against? Is it something that um, I wonder if they're just like, like some of us have felt that kind of cultural Christianity where it's like, you know, we want them to be able to choose for themselves and, 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 and be able to walk out a life that is, um, that's authentic to them. Because maybe what we experienced was actually a, a little bit more of knowing what we're supposed to do, but not really having the relationship to drive it. And so we don't want to have that rub off on them the wrong way. So we just leave it open for them. But I wonder if this might give us a framework for better thinking about discipleship and discipling our children or discipling other people in our congregation and offering ourselves up to be discipled by others in our lives is that we're teaching one another to listen. To listen, yes, to the testimony of Scripture and, and how God has moved. To be able to learn about God's character and, and what God calls us to. But it it all is so that we can recognize the way that God is moving and where God is moving and have ears to hear and eyes to see now that we might position ourselves for the revelation of God. And I wonder if, if we might also use our stories and especially I would say our messy stories as a testimony when we're discipling others, when we're getting them ready for this um, for this life with God that we could offer up like Abraham probably did, like Isaac probably did to Jacob, the messy stories of their lives that showcase and magnify God's faithfulness. Because Abraham tried to take hold of the promise of God into his own hands and, and, and um, make that happen through relationship with, with Hagar and with Ishmael coming about as a result. And, and yet God was faithful on the other side. And I know that Jacob had to have been remembering that story when he messed up and stole the birthright of his brother and then is getting run out of town, which is where we find him. It, he may have felt um, hopeless. He may have felt like, oh, like I'm, I've missed the boat here. I'm not going to be one of the people in my, in my storyline and in my family line who's going to carry the promise because I've messed up. He's not going to think that, though, because he's heard of the faithfulness of God in the face of failure from Abraham, from his grandfather. 
and he probably heard it like on repeat in his mind for so long. And then he comes to this moment where he's failed himself and where he feels like he's missed it. And he's running out of town. He's running away from his brother. And I wonder if he went to bed that night, laying his head on the stone and thought, Lord, where are you in all of this? And then God shows up to him in the middle of the night in a dream. And he's never the same. He has a, a, a revelation that God was there all along and he was unaware. And he is never the same after that moment. He transforms from someone who steals blessings to recognizing that his life was made to bless others. And we see the trajectory of his story coming afterward where God uses um, the marriage to, to two wives. That's an interesting story if you keep reading ahead. But God's teaching him a story in that and then uh, teaching him a lesson in that and informing him in that. And then he goes on to have this, this other encounter with his uncle Laban where um, they make a covenant. He, he learns faithfulness and, and leans into God's um, provision in that. And then he, he comes across Esau and makes reparations and, and leans into healing to bless his brother over and above um, um, what is expected. And this is the transformation that happens and it all pivots right on this moment of a revelation of God's presence in his life. And this is our story as well. If we but lean into an awareness of what God might be up to around us. The, the transformational power of a, a, a recognition of God's presence comes in, in two ways for me. Um, when I look at it, I, I see God's presence speaking identity to Jacob um, because God's, God's presence is spoken through this revelation that, um, that God is willing to work with earth and not call people up and out of their current situations, but transform the space that we're in. That's the story of the, the stairway to heaven is that um, God is using this imagery of an ancient temple that um, would be in the Near East where Jacob is familiar, um, where there's a giant temple and there's stairs that go up to the top of it. And the, the image that Jacob has in his dream that God is using to speak to him is that I'm sending angels up and down in this moment. I'm working. I am here. I am present. And God says, he speaks over the promise that he gave to Abraham and says, I will, I will come through on this to you. So that speaks a certain, a certain presence to, to Jacob that is incredibly comforting because it speaks identity um, into Jacob's life. It says, I'm not alone. It says that I'm pursued. It says that he's um, loved by God. It says that he's forgiven and, and that God is faithful when he's faithless. Um, it also speaks purpose in Jacob's life because it shows that what God is up to and shows that God's God is working um, with a bigger vision to bless all the nations of the earth. And that he is inviting, he's inviting us, just like he invited Jacob, into a larger story. And so there's identity and purpose wrapped up in this encounter that Jacob has. And isn't this what we're all looking for? Identity and purpose. People are trying to find identity and purpose all over the place. We find it, we have self-help books, we've got, um, we've got you know, gurus that are trying to teach us about what our purpose is and who, who we are, and, and we've got every religion under the sun that is trying to answer these questions. And all of them could answer those questions with knowledge. There, there's, there's doctrines that we have in Christianity, and we could read those and go, okay, that's my identity, that's my purpose, this is who God is, this is what God is doing, and I can... I can infer from those things that this is who I am. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And yet, the place that Jacob gets all of this is from a radical encounter with a living God. When he comes into a keen awareness of God's presence, he's never the same. 
He had all the knowledge before of the faithfulness and the testimony of God, and yet his life wasn't, his life wasn't transformed. It is this awareness of God's presence and work in our midst that transforms us in our lives from being dead in religion and, and, and trying to do works of righteousness and striving to earn God's favor or, or trying to change things in the world based on our good deeds and right behavior. And yet, God calls us into relationship and says, let me change you from the inside out and then let me give you new purpose. Let me show you where I'm working. And this also transforms us as the church when we live into a posture of listening and responding to God's presence, we aren't just a church building anymore where people can come and hear information. We become an outpost of the kingdom of heaven where there's transformation. There is a different reality, a different culture present there. We are the body of Christ. And just like Christ said, you will see the angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. He has become, Jesus Christ has become the touch point, the revelation of God. Emmanuel, God with us, the God man, the touch point of who God is and what God is up to on the earth for all of, all of humanity. In order that, as we follow and as we believe, as a community of people called the church, we might be the stairway to heaven. We might be the people who are um, heaven's outpost, heaven's gate, as the scripture says, that we invite people to follow us up the stairs, grab heaven's good gifts and of works and righteousness and, and love and, and come and shower them freely on the earth in the space that we affect. And this is the good news that we manifest. It's not just information. It's a transformed space, a transformed people, a transformed community, all circling, cir circling around God's presence. In this place, we find belonging and we find an invitation to co-labor with Christ, where, like Sheree said a few weeks ago, the burden is easy and the load is light because we're partnering with with God who is doing the work. Jacob might have been deceived before to think that, oh, wow, we've just gotten kind of these marching orders from God. And, and that was 150 years ago. And so I've just got to go ahead and kind of live this out. And maybe, maybe you're like me. Sometimes I read the Bible this way. It's like, okay, I've got the Sermon on the Mount here. I'm supposed to live this way. Do this. Don't do this. But Part of the beauty of this story is that we can't just do that. We, we, there's a recognition in Jacob that I actually can't live this out unless God sends his help. I actually can't live this out unless God leads the way. And even in the Sermon on the Mount, part of the beauty of it is that I recognize in that impossibly high bar that Jesus sets to, to not even be angry with my brother and sister. I can't do that on my own. I can't just read that and try to follow it. I need God's work and presence in my life to lead me, to empower me, to show me, to give me that, that identity as a child of God where I know that I can trip and fall and I'll be picked back up, where I know that I'm growing in grace and where I know my purpose and my mission and where I'm supposed to go left or right. I know my part in the story because the playwright is still very active. The book that we have, the Bible, is not this dead list of rules and regulations, but it's this compilation of stories of God's faithfulness through the generations where we can sit and become students of God's character and work so that when God speaks to us, we know our part to play. We know the trajectory. And we're ready to respond. So I ask this, as a call to action, as one way to put this into practice, would you partner with me in, with, in praying this season for the rest of 2020? And one way, I, I'm going to actually be two ways that you can live this out. One way is 
This Thursday at 9.30 a.m. on the front steps of our sanctuary, we're going to do a prayer walk around the neighborhood. Um, we're going to bring face masks and um, we're going to stay socially distanced. And I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And there's going to be other prayer leaders in the weeks to come. And we're going to do a 30-minute walk. And you can do it at your own pace. You can come back to your car whenever you need. But I invite you into that time to come and pray, to ask the Lord, where are you working? Where is your presence? Where are you speaking? And how can we tune in to what you're up to and how we can respond as believers, as we, how we can respond as a church that we might be a people who bring the goodness and the gifts of heaven and manifest them here in our neighborhood. That people might go, there's something different when I come into that space. I've encountered the living God. I've encountered a different reality, not just information, but I've actually encountered transformation just by being a part of that community. So we want to come and listen for God's strategy and where God is moving and what God is speaking, that we might know our marching orders for the hour. The second thing I might ask is, is as we're in a season of listening, that we might listen to one another better and posture ourselves to learn from one another um, about how to listen to God, about um, what we've learned um, in how to become aware of God's presence and, and even looking to one another's lives as um, signposts for God's work among us as the body of Christ. I, I wonder if you might invite um, each other in, 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 in a time of fellowship after next Sunday's service. This Sunday's service um, is not going to have that right afterward, but next Sunday's service, we're going to have a fellowship hour through Zoom. I know we're hoping to move past that soon. Let's pray into that as a community together. But next Sunday afterwards, we want to get an opportunity to listen to one another. And so we're going to have a time of, of fellowship through Zoom. We're going to break out into different rooms and we'll have some discussion topics and just time to hear from one another and catch up with one another and see each other's face. So I call you to those two things this week. And would also love to hear from you. Um, please reach out to me. Um, my, my number is on the um, steeple. You can call the church. Um, you can email me and I'd love to set up a meeting. So I, I wonder if we might leave with this benediction. Would you pray with me? Lord, you're speaking and you're moving in our midst. We know that you are working to redeem all things in you, Jesus Christ. And that your strategy is the church. We want to play our part. And we want to play it well. And we know that we can't do that without... A, a close, attentive ear to how you're moving and to how you're speaking. Show us your presence. Give us dreams. Give us, give us vision. Speak words to us. Have us minister to one another. Pull back the veil of what you're doing in our hour and in our context. And Holy Spirit, lead us in an active way. Make the word of God come alive to us that speaks a now word into our community, that we might be faithful to what you called us to. As John Wesley said, best of all, God is with us. And just as you met him on the way in his mission to the United States to Georgia, would you meet us on the way as we step out in obedience in the season of listening this week? Would you meet us and transform us in that hour? It's in your son's name that we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you.